Santa Clarita's hometown station, AM 1220 KHDS. Make sure you go to hometownstation.com for all the latest and greatest Santa Clarita has to offer. Also, keep it here. And uh, we have some of the greatest here in Santa Clarita. We have a, uh, a Santa Clarita native. Native? Not necessarily a native. Not native. Not I've native. been here for 15 years. I, I think you can't. I think you get grandfathered in after, okay, after like 10 good. years. I think you're considered. Uh, you a native. just have to stay a decade. Yeah, right, I think good. that's what it is. Yeah, I don't know the rules, but we have uh, Jennifer Trosper, and she is the uh, the uh, what was your title? I have a mission manager for the Mars Spirit Rover. Yeah, I'm actually on an old article, but you have a new title. Currently, the deputy project manager for the Curiosity Rover that's on Mars. Oh, that's on Mars right now. Mm-hmm. Oh man, that's so cool. That is so cool. Uh, but we're doing a little profile thing. You live here in the Santa Clarita Valley. Yeah, we live in Canyon Country. Live in Canyon Country, and uh, you have lived here, you said, for 15 years? On and off. My husband's military, actually, so we went to D.C. for a while and then oh, okay. came back here. So Okay. So, But you've been here. How do you like Santa Clarita for the last 15 years? I love Santa yeah. Clarita. What, what brought you here in the first place? Uh, my job. I, I uh, actually grew up in Ohio and then went to school in Boston and then uh, had the opportunity to interview for the Jet Propulsion Lab and got hired out of college. And so that was kind of the dream of a farm girl from Ohio to go work at the Jet Propulsion Lab. And so I came out here and uh, and that's what brought me to Pasadena. And then when I married my husband, who is at Edwards Air Force Base, uh, Santa Clarita, in fact, Canyon Country was exactly... Halfway right between <laughs> Edwards Air Force Base <laughs> and uh, Pasadena, California. So that's yeah. what brought us here. Awesome. So, okay, so you're grown up in Ohio. Yeah. Uh, do you have, are you like doing bottle rocket stuff? Or what, what got you interested oh, in, in this type of stuff? Yeah, I actually raised animals and I worked in the fields and I did what every Ohio farm girl does. But my dad had previously, when in the 50s, my dad was actually in the Army Corps of Engineers and he worked at White Sands and he worked on the early Thor missile down at, um, at the Cape and so he had these pictures and these stories of, of the very beginnings of when we, the space race, really. And so he, um, he inspired me to do that. I liked math and science. I also liked music. And uh, I think when Dad heard I had the opportunity to go to MIT and interview at JPL, he really encouraged me, as did my mom. They, they basically didn't set any limits on a farm girl from Ohio and said, you want to go land rovers on Mars? Go for it. You know? <laughs> and so, uh, you gra- so you went straight from... From Ohio, Ohio to, to MIT. To MIT. So we're just a small school in, in Boston, right? I didn't just actually a... even know what it was at the time. Oh, really? And, and I got a flyer, and my dad said, you know, you should you should apply. <laughs> and, uh, and then uh, another Ohio native came to our house and interviewed us. And I always joke that I think I got into MIT based on the fact that that guy really hit it off with my dad. And my dad just talked. You know, That's He showed funny. him videos of me and the high school musicals and, and everything. And so... My dad helped me get into MIT, as did my mom. So I think it was the High School Musicals. That's what is what put you over. Nellie Forbush. Yeah, yeah, that was probably it. <laughs> Perhaps that was probably it. Uh, okay, so you're at MIT, and how was your experience at MIT? Which is a you know for people that don't know, it's you, that's the you know for math and science, that's the I don't know the Olympics. I don't even know. I, how to I would like to say MIT is the MIT of of math and of science. engineering yeah, schools. Exactly. Yeah, I mean I I can say it because I'm an MIT alum. I think it's the best. And the thing I really liked about MIT was it was hardcore engineering. We were learning how to problem solve, not just solving problems. And so there's a little bit of a, a difference. There in is that. a there is a big difference. In and that, uh, right? they they taught you how to you know start from knowing nothing to taking huge problems and and figuring them out in pieces. And uh, the other thing I loved about MIT was they had a lot of sports. We were Division three, so. Um, and I was able to play volleyball because I'm only five five. So any other school, Division two, Division one. Did, did you play libero? We did not play Lombero. Our big competitors were... No, the, the position isn't Lombero. Oh, no, you know what? I played, what is that? Is that, is that I played, I played volleyball before that position oh, existed. Okay. <laughs> okay. I don't want to say much that's about my a, Okay, age, I blew it because that's was, the only thing I know about volleyball I was is a libero. setter. I was okay. a setter. Okay. I, I know. A, I, yeah, okay. I knew what a setter was. Yeah. Okay. okay. So you got to play volleyball. I played Sorry, volleyball for four years and... Uh, and then I also, I think I played softball. We, there was just a lot of opportunity to do other things at MIT, which was great. And the community is wonderful. And Boston's a great city. So I have nothing but great things to say about my experience there. I didn't know that about MIT. I thought they were just like a bunch of people that just went and did math problems. I, to be perfectly honest, yeah. I didn't know they had. Most people don't problems. know that. And it's nice that they're in a division where a lot of people play. You know, we even have a football team. Yeah. The Beavers. Oh, yeah. go Beavers. All yeah. right. Okay, so you... you have a, a, a JPL interview. You graduate, or it's while you were still going to school? What was I it? think it was my senior year. I okay. did a couple interviews, one with JPL. I was actually thinking about going into the Peace Corps as well, and then I was also thinking about going into the CIA. 
And uh, turned out that JPL brought me out a couple, I think they brought me out once and I got a couple offers and once in, one in system engineering and one in power. And interestingly, the Peace Corps, I kind of wanted to go and do some f- agriculture and farming stuff and they wanted me to go and do computer stuff. And so it didn't quite line up. I mean, understandably, they wanted me to go and do yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> sciencey stuff. You know, and and so I think the JPL offer was just the most appealing to me. And uh, we had been out to Cal. Actually, when we when I played volleyball, we got to come to UCSD and get creamed by their Division Three volleyball okay. team. But we got to see Cal- and I always loved California, and uh, so it seemed like a neat uh, experience okay. to be able to start my career off there. Cool. And so you got to JPL. What got was the, what were the things you were working on when you first got there? I first got there, and actually there was a mission that. We never flew. So we do a lot of studies of missions that never happen. And there was a, a lunar, actually, it eventually flew. It was a different one. It was a lunar orbiter. Um, and it was many years ago, and we were going to go back to the moon and, and orbit. And it probably took about 10 years before we actually did do that. But interestingly, when wow. I worked at NASA headquarters, I was the program executive for that lunar orbiter um, in between my time here in Santa Clarita. Okay. All right. Wow. So, and then I started just, you start, there are lots of different systems on a spacecraft. There's a power system, there's a communications, there's the control and navigation. There's all the stuff that goes together to make it work. And so I just started kind of working in each of the different areas. I started in power and then I moved to guidance, navigation and control. Then I moved into the kind of the command and data handling, you know, the the computer and the software. And then I moved into the operations. And, and so I did a lot of things so that eventually I became a system engineer, where you kind of put all the pieces of the spacecraft together. And when we, when we flew Mars Pathfinder, which I don't know if you remember, that was back when NASA was doing Faster, Better, Cheaper. Okay. And uh, it was one of the first Faster, Better, Cheaper missions. And it was the first rover we ever landed, the Sojourner rover, the first rover we ever landed on Mars. So I was, I worked on that project and was the flight director for operations. And that was kind of my first big role in Mars operations and Mars missions. How, how I gotta ask this, because it's popping up in my head. Once that rover lands on Mars, how stressful is it? Or is it or right before it lands on Mars? Because what... I mean, there's things like it could tip over or something, right? And yeah, there were... I mean, there's things in place, but how... Like, are you guys, like, totally stressed out? I just imagine a room, just a s- giant room of stressed out people. Yeah, yeah. And the interesting thing is, it depends on kind of what time of year you land, but the, the time it takes for a radio signal to get from oh. Earth to Mars and then Probably back from Mars to Earth, at that time, you know, it, it can be seven to 20 minutes, right? So, so you're sitting there, oh and in gosh. fact, for the Curiosity landing... It was. I think the the one the round trip light time was fourteen minutes, and so, and the whole entry, descent, and landing, when you hit the atmosphere and you're going thirteen thousand miles an hour until when you stop on the surface at zero miles an hour, based on the parachute and the rockets and all the other stuff you do, seven minutes. Oh my gosh. We call it the seven minutes of terror. <laughs> but by the time you get any information from Mars. It's already happened, oh. you know. So it's sort of it's kind of good and bad. Yeah, it's good and bad. That's what yeah. I was going to say. Yeah. It's like there's nothing you can do, um, but you know, for the Curiosity landing, and I would say Spirit and Opportunity and Mer were very similar, except for they used airbags, and Curiosity used a new technology. So when we landed Mars Pathfinder, we were using airbags. We were just we had no idea if this was going to work. So we were just <laughs> shocked when we got the signal back from the spacecraft saying, "Hey, it landed safely." Spirit and Opportunity, we kind of did the same thing, and you know we. We were still kind of shocked, but we expected it to work. We landed two because we weren't sure it was going to work. So that's why we landed two at the same time. And then on Curiosity, we used this whole new technology, the Sky Crane, where we didn't use the airbags because rocks pop airbags and rocks are all over Mars. So we had to do a lot of, you know, um, landing in just certain locations to make the airbag systems work. The Sky Crane could be much more accurate, and it basically was like a helicopter that place the rover carefully down on the ground at, you know, two miles an hour or something. And so that was a new technology that we weren't sure was going to work. So it was extremely exciting to see that because that can land bigger masses on Mars. And as you look forward towards human exploration, right now we have a couple problems. And one is being able to land big masses on Mars. We also haven't ever brought anything back from Mars. We also need to slow down our big masses in the atmosphere better than we do with just the parachute. So it was the first step in some of the new technologies we need to land people on Mars eventually. Wow. This is crazy stuff. 
It's it's super cool. So what yeah. is the so you you guys are up there? You guys are with the the Curiosity is on there right now. Yeah, Curiosity landed a couple year a couple Earth years ago. Okay. A Mars year. Mars years are uh, twice as long as an okay. Earth year. So and we've we landed and have been driving towards a mountain that we we landed in this big crater that was somehow excavated. We're not really sure how. And then this mountain kind of built up in the middle of it is what we think happened. And so we're driving towards this mountain in the middle of the crater because a mountain that built up over time is basically like a history book of the geology of okay. the surface of Mars. And so the rover, we feel like it's kind of our eyes and hands and feet that goes to read this history book that we see there on the surface of Mars. And we just arrived uh, we landed because of the safety of the landing site and where you have to land quite a ways away from Mount Sharp. So we we actually just arrived at Mount Sharp about a month ago and have been doing the first big investigation of that first geologic unit at the base of Mount Sharp, so the foothills of the mountain. Now, prior to that, we actually met the mission success criteria, which was to figure out if Mars had ever been habitable, uh-huh. meaning in the past, based on what we see, uh, what types of rocks there are, what type of chemicals we see. Could a microorganism ever have lived there in the past? Um, we know that the radiation environment today is pretty harsh, and it would be hard for things to live near the surface. But in looking at some of the rocks and what we saw, we determined that, yeah, we think that microorganisms, you know, many, many millions of years ago could have lived, billions of years actually, yeah. could have lived on the surface of Mars. So that was exciting. That's really exciting. And so yeah. now we, we're trying to figure out where where the best places to preserve that information would be. You know, is okay. it, it, and so is it where rocks are just retreating or just getting worn away from the wind where you might have the best, most, the biggest likelihood of finding, you know, trace organics or, you know, a fossil would be the greatest yeah. thing, but you know those those things are hard to find on Earth, right? Yeah. So imagine a robot you're driving around Mars, a couple million miles away, yeah. yeah, yeah. So that's uh, that's really cool. This is cool stuff. So future stuff, I like what do you, like your goals specifically? What are your goals specifically? You know, I would love to see the Mars program through uh, a a really end to end sample return mission, which is where we're headed. I mean, a robotic sample return as sort of this next stepping stone to sending people and bringing them back. Um, And so the next mission we're planning is a rover, a whole lot like Curiosity, but it's got another goal. It doesn't just look at the rocks and the soil and the mountains and the craters we see on Mars. It actually is going to take samples. So we're going to core a sample. Right now we drill into a powder. We're actually going to take rock cores and we're going to store them in what we call a cache. And when we get a certain number of samples, you know, a couple dozen, uh, that rover will probably, the rover will eventually die on the surface of Mars. But the cache will be there for the next mission to come and return it to Earth. So the idea is to get some good well-chosen samples that we think might have the best likelihood of preserving organics or being interesting to, right now, the only Mars rocks we have are the meteorites, which are just, you know, the ones that happen to, (laughs) we find on Earth, right? We can be much more selective about the Mars rocks we investigate. And the analytical labs we have on Curiosity are okay, but they're what you can put on a rover. The analytical labs we have on Mars that could look at these cores of Martian rocks would find out much more information. Yeah. So um, 2020, we're planning on building a rover and ca- and putting the coring and getting all those cached samples there. And then beyond that, we'll build a mission that will go and get the cache and bring it back to Earth. And, and the ascent vehicle and just all that's involved in that is it's a lot of new stuff and it's yeah. pretty cool. That's cool. You get to basically make new toys. Right? Yeah. Yeah, pretty yeah. much, right? Uh, Jennifer, thanks for stopping by. I appreciate you, you stopping by to talking about you and JPL and all that stuff. Well, it's great I to be here. It. And uh, I, know, I know a lot of JPLers have chosen Santa Clarita as their home. And it sounds like you might get to talk to some other ones as well. So that's great. Awesome. Uh, all right, we're going to take a quick break. Local news.